Welcome back, everybody, to What Really Matters. I'm Tablet Deputy Editor Jeremy Stern with you in Los Angeles. I'm here, as always, with Walter Russell Mead, Tablet News Writer, Global View Columnist at The Wall Street Journal, and Distinguished Fellow at Hudson. Let's start with this week's news. First story of the week. President Biden said on Wednesday that weapons would begin to flow to Ukraine, quote, within hours as he signed a $95 billion aid package to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, reaffirming U.S. support for Kiev after months of congressional gridlock put the centerpiece of the White House's foreign policy in jeopardy. It's going to make the world safer, Biden said, and it continues America's leadership in the world, and everyone knows it. The Senate voted overwhelmingly to approve the package after increasingly divisive politics raised questions on Capitol Hill and among U.S. allies about whether the United States would continue to back Kiev against Russia's military assault. According to the New York Times, the 79 to 18 vote provided Biden with another legislative accomplishment to point to, even in the face of an obstructionist House. Walter, news or faux news? Mix, a mix of both. Um, It does it does remind people, and I think we should just note that the Israel Aid also passed by large margins, um, as did the Taiwan aid. And we've got about 70 percent in both houses of Congress, in spite of all the sort of noise that you hear, are still voting in this way. I think that's a that's an important sign where I where I'm a little skeptical, a little more skeptical is I still don't quite see what the strategy is. For one thing. You know, you're hearing, okay, well, this is going to keep Ukraine going till December 2024. All right. So are we going to kick off like right after the election? Are we going to start having the next $60 billion Ukraine vote? And that will keep them going for how long? And I asked myself, how many $60 billion appropriations are there for Ukraine? I would say it's might be more than one, but less than five. What is the, what's the number? And I have to think that, unfortunately, Putin is probably not convinced by this, that the U.S. is in, in it for the long haul, necessarily. And what we would want, again, would for, for Putin to say, you know what, this is pointless. I'm not getting anywhere. It's just costing me. I'm not going to gain anything. I need to stop the war. I'm afraid we're still on the arc of giving the Ukrainians enough to stay in the fight, not enough to win, and then hoping that they'll go to Putin and say, oh, Mr. Putin, let's please stop the war because we're tired of it. Now, if you ask yourself what kind of terms would Putin give them if they asked that, it would they would be tough terms. And so I don't yet see, you know, we've got, as somebody once said about uh, Trump's policy toward Iran, they have an attitude, but not a policy. That's kind of what I still see about, about the United States now toward Ukraine. We have an attitude. We're sort of pro-Ukraine. We don't want it to lose. But do we actually have a policy that will bring about the goals that we seek? I don't think we do. I think the bill mandates a written statement on Ukraine strategy from the White House within 45 days. Do you expect the administration to take that seriously and try to convince and persuade the country? That it has one, or is this, as as you said, I'm sure the statement will contain some really beautiful ideas and an inspiring <laughs> prose. It will underline our commitment to the ideals of democracy and freedom and to the cause of Ukraine. It'll be a beautiful statement. I don't think it's going to, you know, unless it's, it'll surprise me, and I hope they will surprise me by a, a well-reasoned uh, description of our strategy for victory. Well, let's wait and see. All right, our second story. President Biden also announced this week he's signed legislation to ban or force a sale of TikTok just hours after Congress dealt the video sharing platform's Chinese ownership a historic rebuke following years of failed attempts to tackle the app's alleged national security risks. The provision now gives TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, roughly nine months to sell the wildly popular app or face a national ban, a deadline the president could extend by 90 days. The measure poses the most significant threat yet to the app's operations in the United States, where it has more than 170 million users. Lawmakers pushing for the restriction have cited concerns that the company's ownership structure could allow the Chinese government to gain access to Americans' data, claims that TikTok disputes. Walter, is this news or faux news? Well, it's it's the start of what could be news. But again, you know what? The United States, has, we have laws in this country. It's not entirely clear to me that Congress has the power 
just to close down a particular business. I'm not a constitutional scholar or anything like this, but I gather that TikTok's lawyers, ByteDance's lawyers think they've got, you know, a claim. I imagine they can at very least drag this out and delay it a bit. So let's wait and see, you know, how, how did Congress manage to write a law that would be enforceable in the courts? And sometimes when Congress all gets in a, hey, let's do this, let's do this now, um, you know, you sort of get to something must be done. This is something, therefore, this must be done kind of reasoning. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because I would like to see this thing either sold or banned. And I note the fact that Chinese are failing or refusing to allow it to be sold is sort of a strong suggestion that it's not a commercial thing for them. Because if you sell it, you get billions of dollars. And if it's just banned, you get nothing. So a normal commercial enterprise would might, you know, I, I think you might try to defend your right to keep it in, in court. And if that failed, you would sell it. You wouldn't close it down. They're closing it down. That that deepens my concern about what use they think they have gotten or could get from the data. There's also a bit of evidence out there that that um, stories favorable to what China would like Americans to see tend to get higher on those mysterious algorithms. You know, I, I think like stories about violations of Uyghur human rights in China don't get, for some odd reason, the same kind of of puffing that some stories like Gaza stories and so on did. So um, I would like to see this thing banned. I hope Congress has written a law that will in fact do that. But for very good reasons, we have a constitution and we have a court system that doesn't like politicians meddling around with private property and private activity. So tell me when the court decides, we'll come back and talk about news or phone news. All right. It's a good segue into our final story of the week. The Federal Trade Commission this week said employers could no longer, in most cases, stop their employees from going to work for rival companies. The sweeping action could help create jobs, raise wages, and increase competition among businesses, the agency said. But the action is all but certain to be challenged in court by businesses that say they need to protect trade secrets and confidential information. The move bars contracts known as non-competes, which prevent workers from leaving for a competitor for a certain amount of time. Non-competes cover about 30 million U.S. workers, the Trade Commission said, in a variety of jobs that include TV news producers, hairdressers, corporate executives, and computer engineers. Walter, news or faux news? Well, it is typical of how things often work in the real world. So maybe in that sense, it's faux news that what we probably need is a standard that is tighter than the one we have now. I'm not really so sure that 30 million workers in this country are in possession of such vital business knowledge that they should not be allowed to work for anyone else in the same industry. But I'm also pretty sure that the number is not zero. And it's and it's probably bigger than 100,000. So what you have here is, and probably a good bit bigger than 100,000. So what you have here is a ham-handed attempt by um, power-crazed regulators in the Biden administration, because maybe fundamentally some of them don't even like business, to just sort of do some populist thing that is actually legitimately bad for legitimate business. But at the same time, the folks fighting it are fighting it for their own, um, not always idealistic Boy Scout reasons. But that would be business as usual. That's how that's how actually things work in a in a free society, in a market economy. Nobody's got totally clean hands. And, you know, to a large extent, when they're when the regulators are overreaching and the businesses are grasping, we hope that the court system can somehow work it out. All right. That does it for this week's news. Let's have the big conversation. So the protests on American college campuses continued to spread this week, Walter, despite disciplinary threats from school administrators and sporadic police attempts to clear encampments. 
Columbia, Harvard, Yale, NYU, MIT, Michigan, Texas, North Carolina, USC, and others have all seen, quote, Gaza solidarity encampments or popular University of Palestine protests spring up. Organizers, law enforcement officials, and political leaders are now girding for a summer of protests, potentially culminating with August Democratic Convention in Chicago. It was the Democratic Convention of Chicago, of course, that was marred by violence during anti-Vietnam War activism in 1968. And it got me thinking just about the nature of protests in this sense and what the political point of them is and how much they do or don't accomplish. I think the Gaza solidarity encampments very much see themselves engaged in the same activity as the anti-Vietnam War student protests, maybe also the civil rights movement. But I know you've written before about how modern peace movements, broadly construed, are actually quite old, dating back maybe even to the Napoleonic Wars in Europe, and that since then, most civil society peace movements have had actually little discernible impact on world events, and what effect they have had has sometimes been counterproductive. So tell us, what is the relationship of something like these Ivy League pro-Palestine protests to an actual war in the Middle East? And also to the actual workings of political power in America? Look, part of this is the Gen Z is a big generation. Like the boomers, it's bigger than the generation, you know, right above it. It's probably going to be bigger than the generation right below it. So like the boomers, it's probably going to, you know, have a disproportionately large impact on American political, social, cultural, business life, as what they used to say, as the pig moves through the python, as this bulge goes, you know, gradually shrinking bit by bit, as this bulge goes from the front end to the back end of the snake. Maybe that could be another name for our podcast, from the back end of the snake. <laughs> Boomer looks back. But um, so what happens in a generation like that is it's conscious of its power. It's conscious of itself as having kind of a some distinctive experiences and perspectives that it really wants to get out there and do something about. But it does not know very much about the levers of power. And it doesn't actually have that many levers of power. You know, as a 19-year-old, you're you're sort of limited in the kinds of things you can do. So you go for what, you know, you can find. Um, the fact that, you know, you're you're on strike in some cases essentially to try to get your university to divest from some mutual funds and go into other mutual funds. It's it's very, very hard to see the chain of causality from that to what might or might not be happening in Gaza in the next six weeks. You'd have to be maybe a, a more profound analyst of international relations than I am to see that connection. But, you know, but you do what you feel that you can, you know, I, First time I went to Yale was actually on my, you know, I was going for my uh, visit, you know, sort of, you know, tour, campus tour and interview. And it was during the uh, the the trial of Bobby Seale, the Black Panther in the 60s. And so that, you know, the the New Haven, the National Guard had been called out. There were protests everywhere. All the store windows were boarded up. There was an armed National Guardsman every four feet along the storefront all i thought was oh this place looks like a lot of fun i can't wait (laughs) and you know i i have to say we went on a lot of strikes when i was a student they tended to come around exam time when our consciences (laughs) simply could not tolerate a certain (laughs) level of injustice might be into china might be mistreatment of uh, non-academic employees of the universe i mean there were many many causes that that engaged us quite sincerely. I mean, you know, we felt it, uh, but we also, uh, you know, they canceled exams. I mean, that was a terrible tragedy. We had to just go ahead and get grades without exams. Oh, oh. and, uh, you know, and somehow we all survived. Uh, so I tend to think that um, these these protests They tell us something about a generation's sense of identity. They tell us something about the stirrings of political activism in it, but they don't really, they don't, they're, they're unlikely to have a lot of impact. But the other thing, of course, is the fact that you're not getting a wave of protests. Here are these kids who 
have never really been able to affect anything. And now they're going to be reading on the front pages of newspapers, or at least the, the top parts of websites, about, you know, wave of protest sweeping nation. So this is this for them, regardless of what happens to the Middle East or in the Middle East, these folks are going to feel like I'm accomplishing something. We're a movement. This is great. And so I think, um, you know, so there's th these things definitely feed on on themselves. And so we're going to see some of that. And then we'll see um, different schools are going to take different routes to trying to deal with it. But, you know, now any self-respecting student is going to say, well, like, why aren't we, you know, Columbia's got it, Yale's got it, Princeton's going to have it. Well, why don't we have it? Um, there's is going to be tremendous kind of, you know, there's going to be contagion here, so to speak. And this is, you know, so we're, we're going to see a fair amount of this. And the university presidents are going to be tested. Faculties will discuss. I have to say that five years after the student protests of my era, campus life hadn't changed all that much. What about the specific act of street protests or marches or physically occupying buildings? I mean, you, you grew up in South Carolina. You came of age during the later part of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. I mean, I think, you know, back then it was clear what the connection was of, you know, a street protest to influencing national opinion. It was the people who were doing it were risking serious physical harm and, you know, figured that the televised images of them suffering harm might sway national opinion. You know, I in my lifetime now, I've seen the protests against the Iraq War, Occupy Wall Street, the various climate protests, the Women's March. BLM, now the Gaza encampments, sometimes it's it's hard to figure out if protest in this sense is still an essential way of actually holding our government accountable, or is it mostly LARPing at this point? What's what's your sense? You know, there was a time in sort of 19th century Europe only like, or, or in, in a lot of the developing world, even after the end of colonialism, like only 1% of the population was in higher ed. And those really were the sons and daughters of the of the serious elite. And they really did represent in a, in a rather powerful way what real opinion that mattered would be. So a student demonstration in Dresden in 1848 means something entirely different from a student demonstration in Berkeley, California in 2024. Right. Some in these early days, these demonstrations meant the ground was really shaking under the the, the feet of the dynasty or whatever. Uh, today, it just means essentially nothing, <laughs> essentially nothing. And I see sometimes I remember seeing, you know, the million man march, which was not a million man march. And so on. you have these traditional, the, the, the organizers, I ah, was eight hundred thousand you know, the police say, you know, the press will say it's 400,000. The police will say it's 40,000. We know it. No one will ever know. It's just, you know, it'll, those numbers are going to be out there. But the real story is that in a metro center with a population of 30 million, like less than 1% were demonstrating, even if it's 400,000. And that you, you would be an idiot as a politician to think that this was some kind of vote of no confidence that you had to pay attention to. So I think, you know, it's a way for people to show what they feel, but it is not a way to change what's happening in the world. And it's, it's a bit frustrating in that foreign affairs is an inherently frustrating thing because actually... It affects all of us. We all feel it, and especially in times like these or when you see things like a war in Gaza, that it's really very emotional. But very few people have the time or the energy to actually study enough so that you really understand what's happening. And even the people who do are bitterly divided over what it means. And then the question of, you know, how do you affect government? 
governments are very good, even bad politicians, but good politicians are really good at it, of like turning this into, you know, so that if Biden, or we're hearing now that the Biden administration thing of sanctioning a certain regiment or whatever in the in the IDF. Well, I, I have to say, I have not looked into this at all. I have absolutely no idea whether they're, you know, whether this is a good idea, bad idea, whatever. But this becomes this symbolic issue. And if, you know, the State Department ends up saying, okay, we should sanction these people, that, you know, a lot of demonstrators can say, ah, I've accomplished something. Not really, not really. It's it, it doesn't change the way Israel is fighting. It doesn't won't change the outcome of the battle. I wouldn't be surprised, by the way, if, if the professionals in the IDF would be happy that certain equipment got diverted from this regiment to some of the like regular ones. You know, but that's there's a lot of this because people don't really know what the actual pressure points are and don't actually know how to get the government to change the things that matter. You you have people who are basically chasing will-o'-the-wisps a lot of the time. You know, it's like somebody with a laser pointer and a cat. You know, you you the cat is jumping all over the room and somebody's having a lot of fun with the laser pointer, but nothing is happening. And I and I think that's that's by the way particularly true when you talk about student protesters. Because again, the students, you know, somebody's taken like an introductory course in Middle East, in the modern Middle East, if that, right? And so they know how they feel. But, you know, will will the fact that my university pension fund pull out of a certain ETF, does that, does that do anything? No, it doesn't. And in fact, to the extent that it does change investment decisions, it will take money out of the pockets of people who who are, you know, ready to listen to your point of view and put money into the pockets of other people who are going to be able to buy stocks that make money, which is why you want to buy stocks at a cheaper price because this sort of, you know, because a bunch of people are pandering to protesters by doing something meaningless to make them happy. So it's so if you want to make wicked people richer and good people poorer, this is, you know, and you want to do that by putting in a lot of time and effort and risking arrest and expulsion. This is a fantastic way to do that. All right. I'm not sure that it's a particularly good way to do anything else. I think there is a hope that that others will see and be inspired, you know, will, will, will be persuaded to your point of view. Uh, and the fact that you're seeing a wave of demonstrations is probably making a lot of people think, yes, we're really pushing the needle maybe but i think it's more likely that, that you know that you you push the stone uphill the stone when you stop pushing the stone will roll back down but we'll see all right that does it for the big conversation let's end on the tip of the week A relevant reader request this week, Walter, this one from Connie in Orange County, who wants to know, quote, which college or university are you currently most impressed by, i.e. quality of the students, faculty, administration, research, teaching, etc., versus relative de-emphasis on politics and culture war madness? You know, to really answer that, I would have to be a lot more intimately familiar with the inner workings of a lot more universities than I am. I think I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I find over and over again that Americans, parents and students spend much too much time trying to get into a certain college or figure out which college to go to and not nearly enough time thinking through how to make the best out of the college that they actually attend. Because at virtually any college, there are actually going to be more interesting students than you're going to get to know in four years. There are going to be more good professors, even if there's a bunch of bad professors, there will actually be more good professors that know stuff that would be really good to know than you're going to be able to get to know in four years. There will be more good courses in the course catalog that you're going to be able to take in four four years. And there will certainly be more books in the library that would be good books than you're going to to read. 
So somehow the idea that you need to be really careful about which college you'll pick because otherwise you'll just like suck up all that's worth there in your first semester and then be wasting your time because your genius would benefit from a, a different environment. Okay, this is crazy. Now, some of this obviously comes from our idiotic system of, um, you know, sort of making the the name, the brand name of the college that you went to. We we totally fetishize and over care about that. Uh, I can certainly say that from my time at Yale, there were a lot of kids who spent basically all of their time at Yale drinking and partying and carrying on. And there were a lot of kids who went to places, you know, like Ohio State or Florida, you know, all kinds of universities all over the country who worked hard, learned a lot, and from every possible way would be a better employee than the waste Ivy League wastrels, um, of whom there were a great many. And yet a lot of employers will go for the wastrel. And I think that's even worse now than it used to be because, you know, I hired people. And I look at at a, um, you know, somebody's resume and it gives me a GPA and says a little bit about what courses they took. I have no idea what that GPA number means. And I don't really know. A lot, and it's hard for me to find out, uh, you know, what do you t- if you tell me you take American History 101, you know, uh, does that mean you've read Howard Zinn? Does that mean you've read, you know, what what is there? So in a way, you sort of find yourself, and I fight this, and and increasingly with success, um, but you find yourself sort of paying more attention to named schools because you figure the college in, uh, admissions thing is kind of competitive. So maybe somebody that got into a hyper-competitive school had something somewhere. Of course, the more you know about who staffs admissions departments, <laughs> And, uh, and so the, the less credible that seems, honestly, what I would really like to see, I think one of the things that we could do that might do the most for social justice, although I don't think we're going to see any camps on the Ivies about you know, setting up to do this, is some kind of college exit exam. The SAT is an entrance exam, but I think it would actually be of great interest to employers and even to grad schools. If there's some kind of test that could assess what you learned while you were there, my guess is that that actually would give the graduate from Ohio State a way to beat out that Harvard legacy wastrel in in an interview process. And you know what? There's a lot more people that go to non-Ivy schools than, than go to Ivy schools. And I do think that this brand privilege for colleges is one of the real crying injustices in America. And oddly, a lot of the pressure around DEI and affirmative action is not so much as to eliminate injustice as it is to see that minority kids get their fair share of the going injustice so that, you know, enough minority kids can have totally unjustifiable Ivy privilege. All right. That is a ridiculous social justice fight for people to be having. You know, let's let's measure people coming out of college and see how they stand. I think that would be fascinating. Better yet, have a test that if you pass it, you're, you have a BA, like the GED for college. So you can, you can get a college degree without all the fuss and bother. I mean, if you can do it on your own, why not? All right, there you have it. Thanks to our producer, Noam Bloom. Thanks to Will Cummings at Hudson and my co-host, Walter Russell Mead. I'm Jeremy Stern. We'll see you next week. And until then, please go rate and review us. This helps other people find the show.